It's day 13 of the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge, and today we're going to talk about how sometimes we are the limitation. Welcome to the Safer Pilot Challenge. Hey everyone, Jason Schaffer here. Day 13 of the 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. It's a topic and a phrase I don't say often and you probably don't like either, but thinking that sometimes we are the limitation of what we're trying to achieve. Well, today we're gonna talk really and dive deep into aeromedical factors. First off, I hope you're loving this 31 Day Safer Pilot Challenge. It's lucky 13 today. Who's gonna check in down below that they are 13 for 13? Who would be honest and just say, hey, I'm falling a little behind. You got some good homework to go catch up on everything as well. Once again, be sure to like and subscribe, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you are watching this. And again, you're loving these videos, go see inside the online ground school. Let's get that written test done, that check ride prep done. Let's make you that safe real world pilot, m0atrial.com. Today I want to talk about two aspects really of aeromedical factors. Aeromedical factors, uh, spatial disorientation, and let's talk about some oxygen limitations as well. Can I go flying super high up? Well, yeah, if I have oxygen, but my big concern with that is what buzzword? It's hypoxia. And what is hypoxia? Well, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen to the vital organs. In particular, it's a lack of oxygen to the brain, but does include our other organs as well. So oxygen is required, but when am I required to have oxygen versus when am I just simply recommended to have oxygen? Well, they recommend, they being the FAA, recommends oxygen above 5,000 feet at night and above 10,000 feet during the day. It's a recommendation because it's found in AIM 8-1-2. For the regulations on this, we need to look at 91-211. In CFR 91-211, we learned that above 12,500 feet, up to and including 14,000 feet, the crew must be on oxygen, the required crew, if that flight is longer than 30 minutes. Now, that seems very strange. There must be some great science that backs all this up. Where did this actually come from? Well, it didn't come from science, actually. It came from lobbyists. So back when our airliners were unpressurized, were flying things like the DC-3, there was a part of their Rocky Mountain route that would require them to go up to about 12,500 feet. Again, they were flying, airlines flying VFR, imagine that, to get up over the mountains, and it would take them less than 30 minutes to do that. Well, they didn't want to have to have oxygen for everybody or oxygen for all passengers on board, so they came up with this lobbyist-type rule that says, hey, 12,500 feet, if they're, but less than 14,000, if I'm there for 30 minutes or more, cr required crew on oxygen. There's not a lot of science behind it. Everyone thinks, oh, I can't get hypoxic. I'm under 12,500 feet, it's not possible. But every body is different, right? I'm gonna get hypoxic sooner or later than yourself, perhaps. Every physical body is different. Now, continue with 91 to 11, you know above 14,000 feet, required crew continuously must be on oxygen. Above 15,000 feet, the occupants, your passengers, must be provided oxygen. Now, that's interesting. They must be provided. They're not required to take it. If they want to get hypoxic and pass out, I guess that's just their deal. You need to provide it to them. They're not required to accept it though, which I always found as a fascinating part of that rule. So that covers hypoxia and oxygen. Can we spend some time now talking about spatial disorientation? I teach the acronym ICE FLAGS. And ICE FLAG stands for this, and if you have a private instrument commercial or truly any check ride coming up, the ICE FLAGS acronym needs to be in your tool belt because you're gonna be using it. The I stands for the inversion illusion. This is that abrupt change from a climb to straight level flight. It makes the pilot feel as though he or she is tumbling backwards. It's that parabolic arc in a way if you nose it over too quickly. So what do you do? Well, you feel like you're tumbling backwards so you nose it forward more which does what? It just intensifies the illusion. The C in our acronym is the Coriolis illusion. In this instance, the pilot's been in a turn long enough for the fluid in the inner ear to just slow. 
So a turn to a different axis causes the pilot to think the airplane is moving in that direction or on that axis. You tilt the head or you lean back too quickly to pick up a chart or a pencil. It creates dizziness and extreme disorientation. The E in our acronym is the elevator illusion. This is caused by that abrupt updraft, this vertical acceleration that can occur uh, and give you the sensation that you are in a climb. Now, obviously, if you were to hit a downdraft, the opposite effect is going to occur, causing you to put the airplane in a dangerously nose low or nose up attitude. The F in our acronym is false horizon. Do you remember this from day eight, night flying? A false horizon is anything that causes you to believe it's the horizon, but it's not. It could be uh, lights on the horizon, ships out on a lake, a big lake, or the ocean. Anything that causes you to believe it's the horizon, but it's not. The L in our acronym is the leans. In the leans, the ear actually doesn't sense the rolling movement. This is because it could be just such a slight turn, less than two degrees per second. Something so subtle and so small uh, is what it could be. You correct to say wings level and it often gives you the illusion that you're leaning or rolling in the opposite direction. So the pilot physically leans in the direction of the turn to feel like you're flying wings level but you're literally leaning flying strangely like this. A is autokinesis and this is homework I gave you from day eight if you remember as well. Did you do your homework from day eight? I want you to go out, don't be a weirdo, but go out into your front yard, your backyard, find a light two, 300 yards off, just stare at it. Just stare at it and does it start to move a little bit like this? That's autokinesis. Now imagine you're on a long 10 mile final at night and you're just staring at those runway lights and the runway starts to dance. You can find NTSB reports that relate to this. If you haven't done your homework, go do that or go back and watch day eight as well. Then the G in our acronym I use for two things, graveyard spiral, graveyard spin. In a graveyard spiral, the pilot is in, let's say, a steep turn. Spatial disorientation sets in, perhaps. You get the sensation, or you actually literally are descending. You look at your vertical speed indicator. Well, what do you do? I'm descending. You pull back on the yoke more. What happens when you pull back on the yoke? We're trading horizontal and vertical components of lift. In a steep turn team, if I pull back more, is that gonna help? No, it's gonna tighten the turn. When I tighten the turn, what actually happens? I increase my descent rate. So what do I do? I pull back even more. You can see how this vicious cycle takes you all the way to the graveyard, as they call it. In a graveyard spin, again, another worst case scenario here, I enter a spin in instrument conditions, let's say. I'm spinning, spinning. I make a proper spin recovery. Emphasis on a proper spin recovery. But if you've ever done spins, you know how it kind of snaps you back when you apply that opposite rudder. So much so that in this, this state with spatial disorientation, you feel as though you've entered a spin now in the opposite direction. You didn't. You correctly recovered from it. However, now you think you're spinning the opposite direction, you go and institute that spin recovery, which does what? It just instigates a spin in the original direction. You were never spinning to the right, you recovered. But because you weren't trusting your instruments, you enter into the same original spin. The S is a fun one here. Well, none of it's fun. Maybe it's a fun thing to say. It's the somodographic illusion. It's a rapid acceleration during takeoff. It creates this illusion of being in a nose up attitude. Uh, pilots may push the nose down, and this is dangerous because this will happen like during takeoff here, uh, or reduce power even, exactly the opposite of what you need to do. A rapid deceleration could cause the opposite effect. How do we fix spatial disorientation, emzerination? First and foremost, we trust our instruments. Don't trust what your mind is telling you. Don't trust what the seat of your pants is telling you. You trust your instruments. You rely on them. You transition to them early before illusions start. Many of you know this story. Uh, I was a private pilot. I was flying a G1000 aircraft that I got a really I'll use the phrase, I don't like this phrase, but a crash course on very quickly. G1000 had just come out. Uh, it was very, very new technology. I flew up to Tallahassee. I lived in Ocala, Florida, north central Florida, to Tallahassee. Uh, there's really nothing in between there but forest and the Gulf of Mexico. 
I flew up, uh, my meeting ran long, I was coming back at night. My only night flying was the three required hours for a private pilot. And I remember flying back, and, and I kid you not, I didn't know how to dim the screens on the G1000. It just was just was never covered. So I've got these screens just at 100% blaring in front of me here. Of course, it was a no moon night. I've got the Gulf of Mexico over my right, all this empty force. I remember feeling like this and the whole, I don't know, hour and a half flight home out loud to myself, trust your instruments, trust your instruments over and over and over again. It was success, a very successful flight. Um, it showed me that I need an instant rating. And those three hours of night flying, those three hours of simulated instrument uh, for private pilot doesn't prepare you perfectly for that situation. Thankfully, I'd spent time on, a, on you know, playing Microsoft Flight Simulator and everything else and just literally over and over trust my instruments. It was a VFR night, by the way. There just was no moon. Who's ever flown on a night with no moon, clear and 10 beautiful, and you're wishing you were on an instrument flight plan or had an instrument rating. It's that important. I raise my personal minimums for single pilot uh, at night flying because of these illusions that can just sneak in. Think back to JFK Jr. So listen, I hope you're loving this 31 day safer pilot challenge series. Check in down below. Are you 13 out of 13? I want to hear it as well. Don't forget to check out the ground school, m0atrial.com. Have just a blessed, abundant, outstanding rest of your day. I'll see you tomorrow. And most importantly, remember, a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you.